Um, all right, so without further ado, let me introduce our fantastic speaker today, um, Dr. Ravi Selvaganapathy. Um, is a professor of mechanical engineering and the Canada Research Chair in Biomicrofluidics at McMaster University in Canada. His research interests are in the development of microfluidic devices, primarily for drug discovery, drug delivery, artificial organs, and tissue engineering. Um, and he has over 120 journal publications. He's written six invited book chapters and in recent years really developed and pushed the frontier on utilizing biofabrication methods to advance cultivated meat production. Um, so today I'm really thrilled to have him here um, to discuss all of the various assembly techniques and biofabrication methods that his lab has util utilized to incorporate um, kind of co-culture muscle and fat cells uh, to scale the cultivated meat process, um, to allow uh, these structures to form their own extracellular matrices, um, and ultimately to allow us to better understand how we might cultivate whole muscle cuts with a full complement of cell types in a scaffold-free manner. Um, so with all of that said, Ravi, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I will turn it over to you to go ahead and get started. All right. So thanks, thanks, Amy, for the introduction. And, uh, and thanks to GFI for uh, the invitation to present in this, in this forum. I'm really excited to share the work that uh, we have been doing over the past uh, five, six years in this, uh, uh, in this area. Uh, the work that I'm going to share today is primarily uh, done by these two folks. Rana Atala was a former graduate student of mine. Ali Reza is uh, is a current well, he's a grad. He was a gra former graduate student, now a postdoc in my in my group, um, and uh, and is the driving force behind many of the uh, cultivated meat uh, work that I'm going to uh, show today. Uh, so before we start, um, I just want to show you where McMaster is. For those uh, of you who don't know uh, McMaster or Hamilton, so we are located in Canada in the uh, most populous province of Ontario. And if you look at Ontario, the southern part of Ontario um, near Toronto, you see this little dot of Hamilton. And, uh, and so that's sort of the local map. So this is, this is a very exciting area. Uh, there's a lot of universities in this area. Waterloo, you may be familiar with, so University of Toronto and McMaster. These form a triangle of uh, uh, universities which are well-reputed, research intensive, and, uh, and there's a lot of activity going on uh, in this area. So McMaster itself is about 45 minutes from, from Niagara Falls. That's a well-known uh, location. We are on the banks of the Lake Ontario River, and this is sort of the scenic uh, campus. So if you're there in the Toronto area, please feel free to get in touch with me and uh, we can invite you to, to the lab that we have. Uh, so my lab per se, uh, the expertise that we've been building over the past uh, 20 years or so uh, has been in the area of microfluidics and in microfabrication. Uh, so we could uh, basically design microfluidic devices of any dimension fabricated out of many, many different materials, plastics, metals, um, and, 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 and cells and, and gels as well. And what we have been doing over uh, this time is to devote um, attention to these sort of four different areas. So we have a large program in diagnostic assays. We work with small organisms like um, uh, C. elegans worms and, and flies. And you should really check out some of this work. We can control worms using electric fields and so on. We are one of the world leaders in um, making artificial placenta devices. These are oxygenator devices for neonatal babies that are born preterm. Um, and, uh, and we've just demonstrated in an animal model that uh, these kinds of devices can work very much like a natural placenta. And then over the past 10 years or so, We've been active in tissue engineering, primarily in terms of developing biofabrication methods. And we've developed so far about five different biofabrication methods, uh, basically to assemble cells, extracellular matrices in different form factors so that we can get 3D cultures of uh, tissue-like composition. Uh, 
Um, so the cultivated meat work that I'm going to talk about later on is an outcome of some of these biofabrication techniques applied uh, in the area of skeletal muscle and adipose uh, uh, type tissue. But the tissue engineering work also covers um, other areas where we are looking into disease models and also looking at regenerative medicine. The nice thing about cultivated meat is that from a regulatory approval perspective, it's a lot less easier, while the technology that you need to develop is very, very similar. So we can develop a lot of these technologies um, in the cultivated meat space uh, and scale it up. And then subsequently, our idea is that these could become important in the medical space. So this is sort of a reverse of what is conventionally done. Tissue engineering for medical applications has been there for a very long time. Uh, but because of the dynamics of the situation, cultivated meat may be at a stage where technology developer is then subsequently applied in the medical, medical space. So the motivation for me and my group uh, in the cultivated meat industry was in the 2012-2013 timeframe where there was a lot of news items um, from Mark Post's work on um, lab-grown meat and the, uh, the first uh, hamburger, right? So these are some items from BBC that I was able to sort of pick up. Uh, but these, this was my first introduction. And, and, and since then, uh, we've been sort of fascinated by, by this field. And at that point of time, I think what Mark had done was to grow aggregates of, uh, of uh, muscle, skeletal muscle cells um, in gels and, uh, and then extrude it into a, a form factor that looks like a burger and, and eventually do that. So, so at that time, what we had some thoughts on was, can we use the expertise that we've built up in microfluidics and microfabrication in order to try to come up with what would the next generation of this product be? At that time, I think Mark was in the process of starting a company, and there were also other companies that were coming to fore. And so we knew that we couldn't compete in that space with companies which are well-resourced. So it was me and my graduate student who were working in it. So the only way that a university researcher could potentially compete was to look much farther ahead and to look anticipate what would emerge and try to develop some technologies um, for that. Uh, so what we decided at that time was not to focus on this minced or ground meat type format, which from a, from a commercial perspective seems to be the near term kind of goal, but rather look at the long-term target. And this long-term target we thought would be something like this, uh, um, this uh, whole cut of, of, of meat. So a whole cut of meat, what it has is, uh, is of course muscle cells, but these muscle cells are in the form of sort of a, a connective tissue of muscle fibers uh, rather than individual cells by themselves. You also have these kinds of heterogeneous distribution. So you have a distribution where there is areas where it is muscle cell rich and other areas where it is fat rich. So this kind of a marbling kind of effect. And it is also sort of in three dimensions, right? So it's not like a flat sheet or it's not like a, uh, uh, an aggregate. Uh, but rather it is it's a contiguous tissue. And we thought that some of the tissue engineering biofabrication techniques that we would be um, developing could potentially help us achieve something like this tissue. The other important feature of uh, conventional meat tissue is that it has a, a complement of cells, right? So it's not just uh, the, the skeletal muscle cells in the fibrous form, but it also has these isolated fat deposits, so regions where it is fat rich. And then it has um, endothelial cells in the form of blood capillaries and, and so on. It has fibroblast cells. And this mixture of cell types and then subsequently the ECMs uh, that they generate uh, then lead to formation of the actual muscle tissue itself. So, so we wanted to recreate this 3D tissue-like structures. So we wanted to grow things in 3D. And at that time, what we thought was, um, what we needed to do was to perfuse this three-dimensional space with a perfusion network, much like the vascular network which, which we have in the body in order to just provide the nutrients, extract out waste, provide oxygen to cells growing in this three-dimensional space. 
we also wanted at least much muscle and fat cells if not the whole um, set of cells that are there in the in the actual tissue and we wanted any technique that we were building to be scalable right so so these were sort of the four goals that we thought would be very useful in in 2013 time frame we thought would be useful for the future and so we sort of set up uh, to to do something like this uh, around the same time um, uh, okay so so just in terms of positioning in the current cultivated meat space um, this uh, is from from GFI publications um, there are sort of different areas one is investigation of cell lines or the source materials um, for the cells um, the other is cell culture media uh, and then another one is, uh, is is supply chain and distribution associated with it so these are spaces in which I myself don't have much expertise in, and this is something that we are not focused on in our, our research. What we are hoping is that the, the cultivated meat space is growing more and more in complexity each day, and there would be companies um, or suppliers who would be specializing in, in cell lines, in, in uh, serum-free media, and, and so on, and we could just obtain these materials from them. Our research focus has primarily been in the assembly of these cells into a tissue-like construct. So the tissue engineering aspect of it, either with a scaffold or without, uh, without a scaffold, uh, but, but in th terms of three-dimensional structure and so on. We're also a little bit involved in the bioreactor space, not in the expansion of the cells themselves, but rather bioreactors where we can assemble cells and then we can maybe change their texture um, and, and mechanical properties using these kinds of uh, bioreactors. And I'll deal with that a little bit uh, later as we, as we come along. But th these are the primary spaces that we are conducting research uh, in, and we are looking for partners in the other space so that we can test our methods that we develop with the cell lines or the culture media that we obtain elsewhere. So, so the first uh, work that we started out around 2013 or so was uh, at that time, uh, 3D printing was becoming a lot cheaper, economies of scale and the way that they were produced were becoming in such a way that it was no longer a $100,000 device, but rather it was becoming extremely cheap. And so that was around the time that Rana started as a graduate student. Um, and so what we decided was that, why don't we buy uh, a 3D printer and uh, this was a thermoplastic 3D printer. It heats the plastic, melts it, and extrudes it into a fiber and convert it into a bioprinter that is suitable for our purposes. And the primary goal at the time that we thought was most important was to create this vascular network that we can use to perfuse nutrients through and grow cells in, in three dimension. So this is one example of a RepRap printer that we bought like for $600. It's an open source printer. You can hack into the code. We replaced the thermoplastic printhead with this uh, microfluidic printhead. And it's a very simple printhead to print hollow structures. Um, so it consists of this L-shaped channel. Uh, and uh, in the center of this channel, beyond the L-shaped, uh, we insert a needle in. And that needle is in such a way that it is coaxially located on this channel. So now if we flow two materials which react with each other. In this case, we started with alginate and calcium chloride is the, the reactant for that to cross-link it. Uh, if we flow this, the center part, so the, the way that the cross-linking happens is from the inside out, right? So the center part cross-links first and then the calcium diffuses through and then it goes uh, further and further away. Um, so, so what we then did was that conventionally you can do this, there are many people who do this kind of a structure, what they do is they do it in a calcium chloride bath. And when you do that, you get uh, something akin to a tube formed. You can embed cells in this tube and you can use this tube for a variety of purposes. Uh, what Rana did differently was not to put it into a calcium chloride bath, but rather put it on a dry substrate. And when she did this, she got something like this, where because um, the cross-linking starts from the inside out. The inner core of this tubular form 
that emerges from this nozzle is actually nicely cross-linked and it's rigid. But then the calcium hasn't sort of diffused out and therefore the gel around it actually spreads out. And when it does spread out, it is a big mess if you, if you see it. But if you couple this kind of a structure with a 3D printer and you create this kind of a zigzag pattern, back and forth wood log type pattern, and you place these lines close enough to each other, what you see is that the spreading out from one of these lines merges with the spreading out of these other lines. And ultimately what you get is a sheet, a thick sheet of gel, which can contain cells in it, but that sheet is constantly sort of uh, uh, embedded with a tube, which has one inlet and one outlet. And this makes it very easy for perfusion. You can potentially connect an inlet, connect an outlet, pass anything through it, and that sheet of cells is going to be completely perfused. It's gonna get the nutrients, it is going to uh, remove the waste, it is gonna provide oxygen as well. So this was, uh, this was an excellent demonstration of a very simple process. Again, to build sheets like this, it'll take us about a minute in the, in the printer to do this, so it's a very rapid process uh, to do that. What she did was to go to this wood log pile pattern where you go back and forth, and when you do this, she proved that these channels that are formed are structurally rigid and they don't collapse on themselves. If you profuse larger particles like nanoparticles, which are fluorescent, for instance, they stay in the channel. Uh, while if you profuse small molecules, then they diffuse uh, into the adjacent gel. And the structure is rigid enough that you can not only create a single layer, but you can go on top of it and create this crisscross patterns so that you can profuse the whole bulk, right? And she had at that time built about 20 layers deep and, uh, and it was structurally sound and, and rigid. And these are some examples where you can see these channels in going in one direction in the bottom and uh, in horizontal direction in the top. And what she also showed was that in this kind of a vascularized gel, uh, the, the cells that are embedded in the, in the gel itself uh, are able to survive for much longer than uh, anything that just had the gel, but no channels in it, right? Which was kind of obvious, but we needed to demonstrate that this was indeed, uh, indeed the case. What she then did was to uh, sort of change the complexity of the system and show that this technique is also scalable, right? So instead of just a channel and a gel containing a cell, what we wanted to do next was to create structures where we can get radial positioning of different materials in different locations. And for that, instead of having just a single L channel, such as what you see here, we had multiple L channels, right? So just by adding multiple units, you can extend or scale the complexity of, of patterning that you can get in three dimensions from this, uh, this channel. So you can flow different solutions in each of these things. Uh, what uh, we did was uh, basically the inner solution always has to be calcium because your cross-linking is from inside out. But the outer solution in this case could be a gel uh, uh, of alginate, for instance, with a particular type of cell. And then outside that, you could have another layer with a completely different type of cell. So this was an example of a two-layer fabrication. This was an example of a three-layer fabrication. And what we showed again with this is that uh, we can again create uh, embedded channels. We can create one kind of cell uh, close to this channel, another kind of cell in the bulk far away from the channel. And again, we can show that we can print multiple layers one on top of each other and it retains the structural integrity of the, of the, of the construct. Um, uh, so, so, so one of the examples that she did was to uh, first incorporate different cells. So in this case, you have endothelial cells inside and fibroblasts on the outside. And what we showed was this kind of a printing preserves the location of the cell in that radial geometry very well. The bulk is filled with fibroblasts and then the edges are filled with, uh, between the hollow channels are filled with uh, endothelial cells. Uh, more interestingly, what we also showed was that uh, you could have a structure where you could change the material. So for instance, the inner core here was alginate and the outer core was either collagen or fibrin. 
and that can allow you to then culture skeletal muscle cells there and, and other kinds of um, other kinds of cells. So this was one example where uh, this was a new biofabrication technique that we introduced, uh, where we could grow cell population in an alginate gel. And so a company like Mosa Meat, for example, where they're growing skeletal muscle and adipose uh, cells in alginate or modified alginate medium, this could be a very good technique in order to actually grow three-dimensional structures with vascular or perfusion networks to grow cells all at the same time instead of separating them out and combining them, uh, them later. Uh, but for, for, for our purposes, what we thought was that the cell density that we got seeded at that time was quite sparse and low, and we needed a long time, up to 14 days or so, in order to culture the cells to a higher density uh, uh, to be achieved. The other factor was that we were using hydrogel scaffolds, which didn't have as much uh, structural strength as we would have liked. Um, so when Ali Reza came in as a graduate student, uh, he started looking for other biofabrication techniques that we could potentially develop in order to, one, go to higher density, and then two, try to eliminate uh, scaffolds from this so that we can get uh, a more natural meat-like uh, uh, feature. Uh, so one of the techniques that he did develop was uh, this new bio-ink and a molding type fabrication process. So here what we do is we create a mold, um, and that mold is uh, shapes the gel or the construct that is, uh, that is formed, and into the mold, we put in uh, a mixture of cells, high uh, concentration of collagen and, and growth media. So when we do this, um, because of the concentration of collagen, the collagen qu quickly assembles and, um, and that excludes some of the water and it forms a little bit of uh, a well-defined construct within about two hours or so. So it's a very rapid process of, of assembly. And then subsequently, the cells attach to the ECM and then exert traction forces. This further constricts the construct even more, and it shrinks even further, excluding all the media that is, that is present. And it becomes a fairly rigid, but extremely high density, densities of cells very close to what you would see in in vivo tissues within about six hours or so. So this process, uh, the feature of this process is that it's a very, very rapid assembly process within two hours or under two hours or so, the construct, the initial construct is reasonably firm. And then after six hours or so, you could do any mechanical action on this construct and uh, it won't be destroyed. Uh, what we then did was to show that with different um, mold shapes, we can mold actually different features onto uh, this, uh, this construct. And the nice thing with this particular technique, unlike other sort of spheroid formation techniques is that if you take it out of this construct and put it onto a plate, the shape of this construct doesn't change. Um, so with this, what we also tried to do was some patterning. So we could position in different parts of this mold, different bioings, either composed of different extracellular matrices or composed of different uh, cells in it. And if you do that, we can get different uh, heterogeneous compositions of these uh, these constructs. So these are some examples of experiments that we that we did. We tried to do um, form these constructs in small wells or in large wells. Um, and what we saw was uh, that the size of the construct was dependent on the size size of the well. Uh, it was also dependent on the amount of cells that were present in that initial seeding. So if we normalize the radius to the cell number, what we see is that irrespective of the size of the construct, the shrinkage that we get is very similar and it is, it is only dependent on the number of cells that are, that are present. So here we have a way to tune the shape and the structure of this three-dimensional construct by changing the way or the amount of cells that we're putting in or the ratio between the cells and the extracellular matrices that, uh, that we are using. Uh, we also showed that depending on that ratio, we can go to uh, a sparsely populated construct. So here you have a sparse distribution of cells with a lot of extracellular matrix to something which is very densely packed, almost similar to an in vivo situation where you have a very tightly packed 
cellular um, density, right? So these are ways where we can use the initial seeding composition to actually tune how different structures evolve in that, that mold itself. An interesting thing that we found in this was that if we mix the cells, if you don't have just a single type of cell, but if you have a mixture, in this case, this is uh, uh, MCF7 with 3T3s or MCF7 with QX, um, compared to just the MCF7, the amount of shrinkage that we get is quite different. Right? So the mixture actually matters compared to uh, cells uh, uh, that, are, that, are, that are singly spaced. So these are some demonstrations of different shapes that we can, uh, we can get. And these are demonstrations of the heterogeneous patterning that we can achieve with this biofabrication uh, technique. So in order to show the usefulness of this, uh, we started with uh, 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 a technique where we could create a heterogeneous distribution of fat and muscle cells, right? And so if you look at uh, uh, a muscle tissue, what you would find uh, is a particular structure where the muscle fibers are all closely spaced with each other. And then you have pockets of fat, right? These are fat-rich regions. They are co-located with muscle-rich regions, but they are not combined and on a cellular basis. So we wanted to create these kind of structures. And one of the demonstrations that we wanted to do in, that, in this particular paper here was to show that this three-dimensional arrangement is particularly important even for studies where we are looking at the effect of drugs on lipolysis and so on. Uh, and, and here, what we also wanted to uh, demonstrate was that fat and muscle could be co-cultured at the same time. So we started with uh, this process where we partially differentiate the, uh, the um, muscle and the fat cells, so the pre-adipocytes uh, and the myoblast cells here, uh, we partially differentiate them for about three days or so. Um, and then subsequently we trypsinize that and then plate at, um, at, at high densities. And then subsequently we differentiate them or plate, plate into this mold and differentiate them uh, with the same media over a longer duration of time. The idea here being that this partial differentiation will set these cells into differentiation in that particular way. And the co-culture at the end is not going to then change their uh, phenotype. Uh, so these are examples where we have a heterogeneous distribution. So this is an example where we had two wells, one which had fat cells in it, and then the other one which had uh, uh, muscle cells in it. And after shrinkage, what you see is that the muscle cells shrink more than the fat cells and you get this kind of uh, heterogeneous aggregate formation. If you mix the cells up, what you get is a homogeneous aggregate uh, formation. So what we showed here is that one, this heterogeneous distribution is important from a dust drug discovery perspective, but it may also be very useful from a cultivated meat perspective, because we know that the muscle cells and the fat cells talk to each other and the way that they express lipids, for instance, or metabolic products and, and so on and so forth is dependent on this kind of a crosstalk. And so if you are looking at recreating natural structure of meat, then we need to have this kind of a heterogeneous distribution in the cells, um, in the cell population in order to achieve this kind of functionality. So this achieved some of the goals that we set out to do, yet uh, one of the challenges was that it was still in an aggregate form. It wasn't um, scalable beyond a millimeter. And if we have a very dense population of cells, we could only achieve something which was a few hundred micrometers or so in, in, in dimension before they, you form a necrotic core in the center and the cells, cells die. So in order to um, cultivate in 3D, but to avoid perfusion networks, uh, what we looked into is this additive manufacturing technique called laminated object manufacturing. So you may be aware of other more popular additive manufacturing techniques like extrusion printing, stereolithography, and so on. In fact, there are seven additive manufacturing technologies and laminated object manufacturing is probably the least explored of them all. The, the way that this technique works is, is that you have a flexible sheet Right? In this particular case, this could be paper with an adhesive packing on top of it, or it could be anything else. It could be a, a metal foil, for instance. Um, 
and and this sheet is rolled onto a stage and then a particular 2d pattern is cut onto the sheet which is on the stage and then uh, a lamination roller is placed in order to merge the cut pattern onto the evolving object underneath it so you can take a three dimensional object deconstruct it into two dimensional layers and carve out either using a laser or using a cutter uh, shapes in 2d and laminate them either using an assembly uh, an adhesive or using uh, some form of uh, heating method and you can construct any three dimensional object right so this is a well known additive uh, manufacturing process it has been used uh, in paper in wood and uh, in metal films for instance uh, but it has never been used uh, in uh, in in tissue engineering applications um, so 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 we what we thought was well we know how to culture cells in 2d and in 2d culture we don't have any problem with uh, with the need for perfusion networks and so on so if we can use combine this laminated object manufacturing with 2d culture then we can avoid vascular networks create high density uh, cellular uh, frameworks and build to any thickness that we want so that was the the initial idea and so we went about looking for techniques where we can make these kinds of sheets of cells uh, and incidentally Okano's group uh, in, in Japan had for a long time developed this cell sheet engineering technique. Many of you would be familiar with it, uh, where they use uh, this phase transforming surface of uh, poly anisopropyl acrylamide, which goes from a hydrophilic collapsed state to a hydro, uh, hydrophobic collapsed state to a hydrophilic expanded state uh, upon temperature transition. So what they had been doing was that they had been growing monolayers of cells, and then the cells generate uh, an ECM similar to like a basement membrane. Um, and, and then subsequently, when you do this temperature transformation, you can say lift off a cell sheet. Now that cell sheet could be the sheet that you're using in the laminated object manufacturing technique instead of a paper sheet. And then you can basically assemble one on top of each other in order to create any three-dimensional structure that you would uh, you would like. So this was a nice idea, except for the fact that these kinds of surfaces were actually prepared for sort of medical related tissue engineering applications where cost is not that big of an issue. If you want to reuse these surfaces, it becomes more and more complex, very difficult to uh, delaminate these cell sheets after say two or three times of, of reuse. So we went about coming up with a, with a different method that was cost effective, which will still give us these kinds of sheet-like structures. And uh, we came up with this technique, which we call as PISAX. PISAX is pH-induced self-assembled cell sheets. And it's a very simple process. So you take a conventional tissue culture plate and, uh, and you can grow two-dimensional sheets of cells to confluence. Once you go, grow them to confluence, and if they are cells like skeletal muscle cells, which connect with each other, um, then they, they grow or generate ECM by themselves and form a sheet, contiguous sheet that is connected with each other. Now, if you treat this with a slightly acidic medium, so typically we use about uh, a pH of six or so and expose it for about five minutes, then the sheet comes off, it delaminates very, very rapidly. So you can see in real time, the sheet actually peeling off from a surface um, in, a, in a contiguous kind of, uh, kind of fashion. Now, if you let this sit in the acidic medium or in a neutral medium, what ends up happening is that this sheet that has delaminated actually folds upon itself and crumples and forms uh, a, a three-dimensional structure, but it's, it's not a defined kind of uh, structure there. However, an interesting fact is that if you quickly change after five minutes to a basic media, in this case, pH eight, the sheet remains flat. It doesn't change its configuration and you can immediately start pipetting it. You can do any mechanical action on it and it remains a fairly rigid structure, right? So this provided us with a robust technique to generate cell sheets without any expensive um, uh, well plates or tissue culture plates 
Um, and what we also found was that this technique, if you take these sheets and stack them up, which also happens in a few minutes or so, these bind with each other. And after 24 hours, it's very difficult to delaminate these sheets away from each other. So you don't need any special adhesives. The ACMs that the cells are generating already serves as an adhesive binding these layers to each other. And the nice thing is that this can be done in parallel, right? So instead of doing it in a one tissue culture plate, I can do it in a hundred tissue culture plates in parallel, delaminate it and assemble that. And within five minutes, I can get any thickness that I want, right? And so we thought that this was a nice scalable uh, technique to, uh, to use for, for these kinds of purposes. And again, what we do uh, in this case is uh, do a partial differentiation initially, then replate. Uh, so, so we start out with uh, say about 40% uh, cells, uh, confluency of the cells, grow it about 70%, trypsinize it, and then replate it at about 70, 80% confluence. That forms this kind of sheet. And then for the final maturation happens in a couple of days. We then do the lamination of these and stacking. This, the delamination and stacking process happens in a few minutes or so. Um, and then we can do evaluation. So this is a very, very rapid process by which you can assemble high density cells in a sheet-like format and assemble these sheets to almost any thickness that you, that you want. Uh, so, so this is an example of uh, these sheets and you can see the density of cells. So this is a nucleus stain, this is a, a lipid stain, and this is a merger of this. And you can see the density of the cells in these sheet-like structures. We also show assembly of multiple sheets, one on top of each other. Uh, and we show that now you can combine different materials in different sheets. So one, you could have one type of cell, another one, you can have a different type of cell, and you can get these layered marbling-like structure formation uh, with just the sheet assembly itself without any patterning of the sheets also. Um, and, and if you look at the cross-section of the sheet, it looks something like this. Although the cell, um, the tissue plate that we are growing is it's a monoculture of cells, when we delaminate and release the sheet, after a while, they quickly assemble or compress because of the traction forces that they already are, have into a multi-layer thicker sheet, right? So it's still in the sheet form. However, each of these sheets is about five to 10 cells in thickness. And typically they are about 50 to 100 micrometers um, in thickness. And these sheets have very few dead cells. So this is a live dead stain. You can see that the, the amount of uh, dead cells is, is very, very low. Uh, the density after, after delamination, there is a, there's a shrinkage of the sheet. The dia diameter of the sheet actually shrinks, but the structure remains the same and the cell density increases significantly. Um, and so, so what we did from the cultivated meat application was to take this biofabrication technique and combine the knowledge that we had for the skeletal muscle tissue and, and adipose tissue for culture and, and culture sheets, which had both fat and muscle, and then try to assemble them. In order to do that, we used three different protocols. So we, do, we used uh, different ratios of uh, fat cells and muscle cells, just to figure out whether the lamination process works um, even when fat cells are present or other types of cells are present. And then we also looked into different growth media. So for example, a muscle, uh, muscle differentiation media, fat maintenance media, or switching from fat maintenance to a muscle maintenance media as three different protocols and look at the effect of this on the composition of these structures. Again, we use this cell sheet uh, technique, uh, the, the PISAX method that we, we had developed before to grow individual sheets and then assemble multiple sheets one on top of each other in, uh, in parallel. So what we found with these different protocols uh, this is uh, it's a fairly dense, dense graph, but you can find that in the paper that just came out a couple of weeks ago. Um, but the, the ratios that you see here are the ratios of, uh, of muscle and fat cells. So one is to zero means it's all muscle cells. One is to one is an equal composition of muscle and fat. And one is to three is there's more fat cells here. So from a protein content perspective, 
they were all pretty much the same. There was a small difference in the one is to three um, ratio. Uh, and, and from a lipid uh, perspective, what you saw was a small difference uh, in, again, the one is to three uh, ratio as well. Uh, what we really found was that the protocols that we use, so the P1, P2, and P3 protocols had a significant effect in the lipid content of these, uh, these constructs with respect to a base case, which was just pure muscle culture. So using this, what we thought was that just the way that we are growing these cells, we could potentially tune the amount of protein and fat that we have in these things. And this tunability is very important because with the same starting materials, you could potentially achieve something which is a lean meat type composition to something that is, which is a fat rich uh, composition. You can go anywhere between 5% to maybe 20% or so. And that tunability can give you very pre precise um, uh, compositional characterization of the sheets that you're, you're building. Okay? So this is some close up view of the, of the tissue itself. Uh, and what you can see is that these are where the, the PT3s are labeled as, uh, as, uh, as green. See, to, uh, the muscle cells are labeled as, uh, as red. You can see that the, the muscle fibers are, are formed. They are closely and densely packed. They are random in orientation. Uh, but you can also see the, the fat being dispersed uniformly throughout the, uh, the, the structure itself. So the merge image shows this mix of fat and muscle cells, but actual structures forming where you have these muscle fibers uh, or myofibers that are formed as well as flat fat globules that are, that are being present. So a close-up view of this shows these actual intact fat globules in the tissue itself, showing that the fat cells are fully differentiated and are producing uh, the lipids that they typically produced in a co-culture. With, uh, with muscle, muscle cells. So we characterized these different protocols in terms of not only their fat and lipid content, but also their ability to detach. Obviously, when we only had muscle cells, the detachment process was much easier compared to when we had fat cells. But by changing the ratio of the fat to muscle cells, we can enhance detachment uh, as well. So, so this is interesting characterization of all the assembly and compositional thing in, in one, where we could then identify what is the best possible combination to get both good detachment as cell sheets, but also the kind of um, uh, protein and, uh, and, and lipid contents that you would uh, potentially like. So once we had these individual sheets, we could stack them up on top of each other very quickly. So this is an example of a single layer after delamination. This is where you have two layers, one on top of each other. If we have a single layer, then the traction forces between them are strong enough that they actually shrink to a much smaller dimension after a day or so. If we stack multiple layers on top of each other, the amount of shrinkage that we get reduces. And we believe that the connection that is formed between the individual layers reduce the amount of shrinkage and uh, keep the, the size originally similar uh, slightly less, but uh, not as small as the individual delaminated layers. Uh, so this is an example or a picture of 18 layers that have been stacked uh, one on top of each other after incubation. Um, and this is a top view of a six layer stack after incubation. So these are things that we think are scalable processes. There's no reason why we can not go to larger and larger plates. Uh, develop delamination techniques, automated delamination techniques for them, and continue stacking multiple layers one on top of each other in order to get thicker and thicker structures. With this technique, I think we believe we have solved the perfusion problem. We don't need perfusion. You can do two-dimensional culture, grow the right composition and so on, hold on top of each other and get the thicknesses or three-dimensional structure that is, uh, that is required. What we also wanted to do apart from this, so here, uh, if you see uh, the, the muscle myofibers are all oriented in all different directions. We wanted to find a way that we could provide some stimuli in order to orient them in particular directions so that we can get the anisotropy of mechanical properties that a muscle tissue will have. For that, we 
uh, are investigating a different biofabrication technique. This is called a tissue in a tube biofabrication technique. And you can look at this journal here. But this is, again, a very simple technique. We take a silicone tube, silicone or gas permeable tubes. So we take that tube, put two pins on either end, fill our bio ink into this. And quickly, within a couple of hours, what you see is formation of a construct with cells and uh, extracellular matrices in this. The, the, uh, the pins that you have basically are anchoring points. So they provide uh, a mechanical tension to the forming or the, the shrinking uh, construct that basically produces a mechanical stimuli. But you can also use electrical stimulation on top of it in order to provide an electrical stimuli. So uh, these are some examples of these kinds of tube structures that have been uh, formed. If you form this in two hours and take it out and put it into a well, they shrink significantly, but still retain that form factor of tubular nature. Um, and this is something that you get. If you retain them in a tube where you do not provide any electrical signal, but only this mechanical tension is present, then they shrink a little bit, but not too much. But when you provide both this mechanical tension as well as electrical signals, which we call as a dynamic condition, then they shrink to the same extent as, uh, as when they are taken out. But more interestingly, if you do an actin stain on them, what you see is that in the in-well structures, the first one, you see these random orientations. But in the dynamic structures with the electrical stimulation, the orientations are in the same direction as the electrical field. So if you quantify that, what we see is that the width of the graft in the in-tube condition over here is much larger than the dynamic condition. So the dynamic condition here is as packed as the, 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 the shrinking constructs that we've shown before. So you can achieve cell densities very similar to in vivo-like cell densities with the dynamic case while your relative protein content is very similar to the in-tube uh, in case, right? What we also show in this format is that you can also do patterning. This patterning can be axial and this patterning can be radial. Uh, this is due to the rapid assembly. So we need only two hours for that initial half to assemble. So we can put some bio ink in there, assemble one type of cell or one type of cell with an ECM in it. And then we, put, we can put the second bio in two hours later, assemble another one. And what they form is very contiguous constructs, which have good rigidity. The stiffness of these constructs are pretty strong. And this is another way that we can potentially assemble fibers and then subsequently assemble macro structures out of these things. One of the other ways that we have built uh, in order to provide mechanical excitation to these kinds of tissues is this kind of a uh, rotating framework, which can take a tissue that is in this tube and actually move it back and forth to provide that kind of a cyclical mechanical stimuli that can allow orientation of uh, myofibers in certain directions, as well as provide this anisotropic stiffness property for these things. The nice thing with this technique is that you can create extremely large fibrous structures. So these are um, uh, more than say 10 centimeters or so in length, you can create different dimensions. You can go small size to large size, depending on the tubing dimensions uh, that you have. You can create bifurcations like structures, and you can create hollow structures in them as well. And I think a combination of these techniques will allow us to create the kind of macro structural complexity that is there in, in actual um, meat. So in terms of uh, future directions, um, what we are hoping to do is to extend beyond just muscle and fat to introduce these endothelial cells, fibroblasts in it, so that we can auto-generate the extracellular matrices that we need in order to form this muscle-like structure. Ultimately, we want to minimize any extra things that we want to add. We don't want to include scaffolds in, in these things. And I think the sheet technique allows us to do that because it, the only thing that we are adding there is the cells the cells generate their own ECMs, they generate their own scaffolds, and they form their own uh, structures. So creating these appropriate microstructures is also something that we think is important, and that is another area that we will work on. We also want to develop these bioreactors, which will 
be able to grow these sheets, delaminate these sheets, and then exercise these sheets using biophysical stimuli in order to create the kind of uh, anisotropic features that we require. And then we are hoping to collaborate with companies and groups who are working on cell-free media or serum-free media and cell lines or um, stem cells that could be used for growing both muscle and, uh, and, and fat tissue. So we recently, using these biofabrication techniques, started a company called Caro Meats, which is likely to popularize or commercialize this, uh, this assembly technology. And I'd like to thank all the funding agencies uh, for their generous support through this, uh, this work. And uh, that's the end of my talk. Happy to answer any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ravi. That was fantastic. Um, I am going to kind of turn um, turn over to the Q&A section. Um, we have lots and lots of questions. Um, I love the kind of engagement you're driving with our community. Um, I will start with this question from Elliot um, about uh, stacking your various cell sheets. So. Um, when you're stacking your cell sheets, how long does it take for the layers to attach to each other or to achieve a differentiation state that would yield a favorable texture? Um, presumably, the cells in the center of the stacks would uh, experience cell death due to lack of oxygen and nutrients before that is achieved. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, certainly, if you have a thick stack, then some of the cells in the center would die. What we have found so far is that when we when we stack these sheets one on top of each other, um, within about two hours or so, they are nicely attached to, to each other, right? Uh, and it is difficult to remove them, but if you want to really peel them apart, you can do that. But after 24 hours, it's extremely difficult to break them apart from each other, right? And so the uh, delamination, there's no difference in delamination between sheets at the top versus sheets in the, in the center. And so we think that the cell death itself is not necessarily affecting uh, this, this adhesion. We think that the basement membrane type ECM that is generated is a causative reason for this, this addition rather than the cells themselves. So the, 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 the cells in the sheet are sort of encased in the ECMs that have been generated by, by the cells. And so it is the contact between the ECMs that we think is the causative reason for the adhesion rather than the cells themselves. So although the cells in the center die eventually, this is the last stage of the assembly. So the nice thing with the meat is that the, the meat is dead cells anyway. And uh, so this assembly that we're building, we have all the cells generating the structure and so on um, initially when we are cultivating. And then the assembly at the end is almost like uh, cutting the meat away um, from the animal or sacrificing the animal, where once you sacrifice the animal, the meat, the, the the muscles or the cells there die because of lack of nutrient and oxygen. It is a very similar process that is happening after the assembly. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, there is a related question here from Gaurav, um, again about this multi-layered sheet. How do you think we can further scale up this process while still pervert, like preserving cell viability given diffusion limitations? Um, because we're looking at a scale of um, various centimeters and inches in all dimensions when we're talking about whole muscle cuts. Yeah, so, so I, I think in terms of um, the thickness, uh, going to uh, a few centimeters uh, to an inch shouldn't be that big of a problem, right? So typically what we get is the thickness of these shells. We, we, we haven't optimized the, the cells for ECM generation. Uh, one of the things that we could potentially do is if we include other cell types, we can have more ECM generation. And if you have more ECM generation, then we can get thicker individual sheets, right? So, but for, for the ballpark, if you take 100 micrometers per sheet, then we're going to get uh, about 100 sheets to be a centimeter, right? And growing these 100 sheets in parallel and assembling them 
uh, assembling uh, the the assembly process is going to only take a few minutes, maybe 10 to 15 minutes or so. So I don't think the scaling up in thickness is a problem. Scaling in the x y dimension could be uh, something that is going to be challenging if you want to grow to a few feet or so in dimension, right? But if you are looking at a, a cut of meat, then you're looking at about 10 centimeters, maybe 15 centimeters or so, which should be a reasonably uh, easy process for us to be laminated. We still have to build those systems, but we think there is a there's an evolutionary path to that rather than we don't need any big transformations. Yeah, thank you. That's super insightful. Um, I want to encourage everyone who's dropping questions into the chat um, to please put your questions into the Q&A section of your Zoom bar instead. That's where we're tracking questions for Dr. Ravi. Um, so we have a question here, a few questions um, about the start of your presentation. Um, a question here from Eric is whether it is possible to change the internal diameter of the tubes you used by changing the flow rations. Uh, this is uh, which which of these techniques? Uh, the tissue in the tube, I believe. Well, so yeah. So so the the diameters of the tubes that we are forming, uh, I assume it's the last technique that I talked about, uh, will determine the structures that uh, that we form. So by changing the tube diameter, we can actually change the sizes of the. The, the tubular features that, that you're forming. And uh, one of the things that we've demonstrated is that they connect with each other. So you can go from thick diameter to thinner diameter very easily by connecting the appropriate tubing size. But that is also another bioreactor that we can grow to, to have this tissue form and we can even braid these um, tubular features into more complex geometries. Awesome. Um... A related question is about what the diameter is of the embedded hollow tubes that you used. Ah, so sorry, that, that, that was the first, first technique. So the, that diameter of that embedded hollow tube um, could be anywhere between, uh, the, the smallest that we have achieved was about 300 micrometers, but you can very easily get 500 to upwards of a few millimeters quite easily. Fantastic, thank you. Um, here's a question from Maya. What kind of collagen were you using? Um, do you have any suggestions for animal-free ingredients that could replace collagen and still retain the same properties that are desired, like its, it's um, fat-like taste and scaffolding properties? Yeah, so, so we were using bovine collagen and, um, and this was from Thermo Fisher, they had a high concentration and that was one of the four aspects of this that you need to have collagen at a high concentration for this rapid, uh, rapid assembly. But the point is, is, is well made that you require um, uh, uh, an animal free way for this. And that's one of the reasons for moving to the cell sheet technique is because you don't need to add anything other than the cells. The, the cells develop their own ECM and that ECM is much more diverse than a sort of a single component that we're adding with, with the collagen. And what we are finding is that that diversity is quite important in the kind of um, expression that uh, the, the cells have of the different uh, molecules that they express and, and to get to close to natural uh, properties. Thank you. Um, here's a question um, from Alexia. Um, about uh, your co-culturing technique. Assuming that the initial cell cultures are grown in individual types of media, what's the best way to mitigate implications from uh, changing that media or media change? Um, she's specifically referring to what happens to the cells in terms of culture, structural integrity after the cells are partially differentiated and merged into a co-culture for maturity. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, that's something that we haven't studied, but that's something that we should. Um, but uh, so, so the, the, the work that we did was uh, uh, to show that partial differentiation, you could, do, you could partially differentiate and then co-culture, and then they don't revert back to their older phenotype, right? And they can actually produce functional features like the fiber formation or uh, fat fat generation, right? But that is not an optimized process at all. When do you stop the partial differentiation and when do you start the co-culture? 
is a question that needs to be optimized uh, from various angles. So some of it is more tissue related properties in the end. Some of it would be biochemical properties uh, itself, the composition of the meat that you're producing and so on. But that is a, that is a work in progress, but it's an excellent uh, point. Um, awesome. Uh, kind of piggybacking off of your response to an earlier question um, around stacking um, each of the cell sheets. Do you think it would be helpful or even necessary to perform the final stacking step at a lower temperature if the stage is analogous to the post slaughter period in conventional meat that typically doesn't happen at 37 degrees Celsius. So um, would this improve the quality of the final product in your opinion. It may uh, do that. I mean, I, I don't have direct evidence for something like this, but uh, what we find is that um, after stacking, when we freeze, then we see a change in mechanical properties, right? So when we freeze, um, they become more stiffer, not just because of the freezing process itself. So, so low temperature assembly could be something that we can definitely consider. And that's another way to optimize. So, so far, we were focused on generating that proof of concept that we didn't optimize anything. We looked at something that worked and uh, and proceeded farther along. But each step of it could be potential for optimization. Thank you. Here's a question from Jason. With respect to cell orientation during maturation, have you looked at dynamic mechanical stimulation, for example, cyclical strain in conjunction with e-stim? That's that's exactly what uh, what we are planning moving forward was, uh, so I did demonstrate the mechanical and electrical stimulation in this uh, tissue in a tube format where we are making these fibers, but we are doing exactly the same thing for the cell sheet as well and building bioreactors where we could uh, basically get these sheets and then also stimulate them mechanically and electrically to get these oriented fibers. And with that, we will get the kind of anisotropic texture that is there. In the so, so that's a work in progress. So. Thank you. Um, here's a question. Um, again, I, I know you haven't yet had the chance to visit the chat, but lots of people are so enthusiastic about the research you shared today and, and really grateful for you taking the time to share your knowledge with our community. Um, this question is from an anonymous attendee. Um, because the plane of cells are kind of more or less flat before stacking, what do you envision the growth container ultimately looking like in terms of size and dimension in order to create a practical meat portion? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I mean, the, the way that I would think the simplest way to start is uh, almost um, just grow this into a larger plate, right? So that's that would be the simplest thing. But you could consider this into a roll-to-roll -roll kind of fabrication process where a sheet um, uh, is, is made very similar to sort of paper making and, and other, other technologies. And we could potentially envision growing large sheets and then cutting and chopping those sheets up and, uh, and using very similar process sim to paper making to assemble these, uh, these uh, cell sheets. Uh, but the the important thing is to minimize the amount of, of nutrients that are present or used in this process if you want to lower the cost. So something that is a flat sheet with a package on top that could be filled and produced over a period of time when the cells are being grown would be something that uh, I would envision as, a, as an intermediate step to maybe a roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing later on. Thanks, Ravi. Um, here's another question from Darcy. Um, again, thank you for a fascinating talk and your impressive work. Um, Darcy studies the secretome of intermuscular adipose tissue and the crosstalk between IMAT and skeletal muscle. Um, what they found is that, in fact, the majority of what is secreted by IMAT is derived from the stromal vascular fraction rather than the adipocytes themselves. 
you mentioned this while you you described you know your future directions and they're interested in the ways that you're imagining overcoming the challenges of including the contributions of immune cells endothelium etc in your co-cultures yeah so uh, absolutely right i think i think that area of co-culture has been underexplored just because of the fact that it is very difficult to co-culture all of these cell types together right so so one of the challenges that we are seeing is that if we want to go beyond just fat and muscle to other cellular features and, and types, then we need to create the conditions where they will actually form these features and, and structures um, in the way that they would uh, in, a, in a monoculture kind of uh, fashion. Uh, but but uh, it, it, the, the interactions are absolutely critical. If we want to achieve a tissue similar to an in vivo type tissue, we have to recreate these interactions, both even for cultivated meat, but also in drug discovery and, and other, other areas. Um, and, and what we would do, the nice thing with the cell sheet format is that the, the skeletal muscles in some senses would be realized uh, form almost like the basement plate. It provides the structure and the scaffold and can contain a large amount of other cell types, right? So we have in fact co-cultured with three times as many fat, you can still do delamination and you can get them as, as cell sheets, right? So there is no reason why we cannot replace the some of the fat cells with other types of cells. So endothelial cells um, or fibroblasts and so on and create a more complex or a diverse mix and, and hope that what happens in nature will also happen uh, happen over here. The only impediment to that is to, to find the right conditions where all of these cells will be happy enough to, to survive, and the complexity of the problem grows as you increase the number of cells in the mix. But but that is that's a very interesting area, very fascinating area, has implications much beyond cultivated meat also. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we only have 18 questions left. <laughs> um, here's a question from Eric. What kind of cell densities do you think are achievable for the two two-dimensional stacking sheets in a three-dimensional space during culture? Um, so do you have um, stats around cells per milliliter um, for, to indicate? So, so we, uh... We start with 10 power six, uh, and then by um, by the, uh, when the when the cell sheets are assembled, it goes to about 10 power eight or so. So it's, it's about a factor, when we did the calculation last, it was about a factor of, uh, it, it was about 50% or so of the in vivo cell densities that you would, uh, you would normally have. Um, so, so, so what we are thinking is that we are achieving the kind of cell densities. If, if you let the cells assemble by themselves, they are going to create conditions which are very similar to what happens in an in vivo uh, condition without biophysical stimulation kind of thing. And, and, uh, and that's why I like the assembly technique compared to the bioprinting. So we started out as a bioprinting thing. I'm in mechanical engineering. I love to build printers and so on and so forth. So I started out that way. Uh, but I think um, using nature to do this assembly thing then solves a lot of problems, right? You cannot top down engineer everything. You have to let uh, the, the cells function as they would and they will naturally assemble to an ideal situation that they prefer. Right? Great, thank you so much. Um... Here's a question from Joe Getze. Following up on your section on attaching the adipocyte and myotube layers, was um, the myotube or adipocyte media the best for sheet attachment? Were the layers differentiated separately in their own media and then combined? So, so the duration of the sheet attachment is a very brief period, right? So it's about five, 10 minutes or so. For smaller sheets, it's very, very quick. For larger sheets, you need to sort of orient these sheets and so on, so it's a little bit uh, longer. But everything happens within 20 minutes or so, right? So depending on the number of uh, number of layers. Uh, so, so we just use DMEM for this purpose. We haven't looked into any other media because it's already available, we did that. 
Um, so, so we don't know if it is important or not. We know that this works. Um, other media may introduce delamination or so. Uh, but again, you have to imagine the sheet uh, not as cells actually growing and protruding, but the cells are actually covered with their ECM, right? So, so it is the interaction between the ECMs that are actually doing this. You can also promote more stiffer interactions. What we've used is other agents which promote cross-linking between the ECMs that are generated in order to get more stiffness. And so you can tune stiffness that way as well uh, as a post-processing after this assembly has been done. Thank you. Um, and again, about the structuring of, of um, these, or the stacking rather, of these independent cell sheets to start. Um, ben has a question about what the texture might be like when you're eating these multi-layered structures. Because they're all kind of grown independently to start with, do you anticipate that it would be very mushy, like they would all kind of collapse into each other? Um, have you, yeah. So, so so, so, so my student has actually um, uh, cooked this in oil, right? <laughs> and and uh, and they appear in consistency to be um, similar to what you would expect from a meat, right? Uh, now uh, they don't have this fibrous nature, so that fibrous nature, uh, because the fibers are all randomly oriented, uh, they don't have this macro structure of fibrous nature, which we should generate through biophysical stimuli and, and so on. Uh, but, uh, but consistency wise, the cooked meat is, is pretty um, similar to what you would expect uh, from a meat-like uh, tissue. Uh, we haven't eaten that um, mouse meat yet, but uh, we are in the process of making, we, we just got some um, rabbit cells and we are in the process of making rabbit meat and which we would uh, then consume and provide an idea of the texture and, and the taste. Right? Looking forward to hearing the chef's review. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a question from Rebecca. Um, just asking that you maybe elaborate on how the laminated object manufacturing approach could be used to create a vascular-like network. Um, she seemed, she, uh, when, when you cited this alongside two other techniques, um, it wasn't entirely clear to her how LOM could be used for vasculature. So if you could just expound upon that a bit, I think we'd appreciate it. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so we also, uh, one of the fabrication techniques that I did not talk about uh, is a method called Excel. Uh, and uh, there, what we do? Uh, can I can I present? Uh, yeah, I have a slide. Okay. Okay. So, are you able to see the? Yes. Okay. Good. Hopefully, showed me. Yeah. Okay. So, so this technique. So, th it's a, it's a good question. Uh, for using this laminated object manufacturing in order to uh, create vascular networks, uh, this technique could be potentially useful. So this is a technique called extrusion cellulose lamination technique. So what we do here is we take a sheet. So this could be a scaffold. In this case, it's paper, but it could be other scaffolds like thin soy, porous materials or other materials that uh, are edible in nature. And then what we do is we print our uh, bio ink on top of it. So the cell ink is printed on top of it. You can print any pattern. If you want marbling pattern, you can do that um, as well. And then what we do is we cut that scaffold, right? So we cut it in the form of a vascular network, and then we assemble multiple sheets on top of each other. So that hollow region in the middle can be a vascular network and you can allow flow through. So if you stack enough layers up one on top of each other, you could basically create a network path through that three-dimensional stack that you can also potentially um, perfuse through. Now, I mean, it is feasible that you can make your cell sheets into these individual layers and you can make, make do a cut and then you can assemble them as well. That's also possible. So those are all techniques that we are, we are looking at uh, potentially to, uh, to, to enhance the complexity of this. But I think, 
from the cultivated meat perspective, you don't necessarily need vascular network. So with this cell sheet stacking method, you've eliminated the need for this. Uh, if you want to use it from the perspective of um, regenerative medicine, where you the tissue has to be alive after implantation and so on, then that kind of an approach could be used. Thank you so much, Ravi. Um, we have a question here around um, the cell lines um, that, that you used. So in, in your work, you've used immortalized cell lines to conduct this research. Um, what do you anticipate um, will be some of the process changes required when you switch to cells from primary culture? Uh, maybe the order of the efficiency of the assembly of the layer, the differentiation time. Can you speak to some of those anticipated differences? So, so we are in the process. So the, the work that I've shown is, is about six to eight months uh, before. So we are in the process of uh, using primary rabbit muscle cells in order to create these sheets. So we have been successful in creating these sheets uh, from rabbit muscular cells. The culture conditions are a little bit different from this, but the delamination happens in a very similar way. Uh, we are also acquiring rabbit fat cells and, and hopefully they will also be, um, we would know whether we can co-culture them simultaneously. So the culture conditions change a little bit between primary cells as well as uh, cell lines. Uh, I'm sure with uh, other, um, say stem cells and so on, they would be very similar as well. Um, but, but I think the overall process largely remains the same. Uh, the kind of adhesion that we are seeing with the primary cells is much more stronger than we see with uh, cell lines. Uh, the thickness of the layers that we are generating are also different. So the parameters will change a bit, uh, but the scheme of the process uh, is successful, at least for primary rabbit muscle cells. Now, with chicken and with beef and so on, I, I'm sure that there will be changes in culture conditions and so on, but, uh, but that is anticipated. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's exciting that um, kind of the foundational approach is extensible to primary cells and you have early evidence to suggest that it'll be extensible with some parameter adjustment to meet relevant cell types as well. Um, here are um, just, a, I think we can probably tackle two last questions before we wrap up. Um, for today. Here's a question from Kathleen. Um, do you think there might be any advantage to coming up with a completely different, a completely novel 3D structure um, that's maybe easier to produce that could also be used as a means of brand differentiation? Um, I imagine she's talking about kind of end product, um, like structure shape. Um, so maybe we don't strive for the classic chicken breast or, or T-bone steak, um, but rather something new altogether. I, I think that's a great comment. I think uh, that's the way to go, at least in my opinion. So uh, the, the cost structure of um, the cultivated meat has come down significantly, but it is still higher uh, compared to uh, conventionally available, uh, available meat. But I think it is these bespoke products that are going to uh, demand the premium and drive the market, at least initially, while the, the technology becomes more uh, mainstream and regular and so on, so that the cost of the overall production actually goes down, right? So you can get down to say $100 a piece um, or so, and then getting from 100 to 10 will require large scale production. And, and it is these premium products that are going to potentially uh, be uh, the, the drivers, the early drivers of the technology till that cost reduction uh, happens. So that's that's my opinion of this. And so culturing things, for example, in different ways, using three-dimensional printing approaches or, um, or the approach that we have been uh, doing, for instance, but also creating combination and hybrid products, right? So like the, the cell types that, uh, that we, are, we are introducing along with other uh, plant and, um, and uh, fibers, for instance, and so on. So those are all products that 
uh, will be very useful. In our case, I think the tunability, the ability to tune the fat muscle content is I think a key differentiator um, because uh, what, what we say is that um, milk, you can get it, skim milk, 1%, 2%, 3% milk, meat, you cannot get it right now, but with this technology, you would be able to do something like that, right? And, and there will be a market where they would want to know what is the precise compositional content uh, of their product that they consume. And that'll be a key initial driver, which will then lead to widespread adoption. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Ravi. Um, I think a light, um, a kind of a related question to your last point is, um, you know, whether you measure lipid and protein content in the three-dimensional constructs that you built and, and how you went about measuring um, that breakdown. So, so what we do is we deconstruct the, the, the assembled tissue. Uh, so the cell sheets, we deconstruct them. And then subsequently we uh, just use regular BCA assay for protein, Nile red for, for lipids. To, so it's a, it's a regular process, but it then first initially deconstruct the whole thing and then do the measurement. Thank you. Yeah, the kind of tunability you're talking about when it comes to cultivated meat is a huge advantage, I think, in comparison to conventional meat counterparts. Mm -hmm. um, here's the last question um, that I'll ask you, and then I'll let you kind of scan the, the remaining list of questions and see if there are any you're particularly excited to jump at. Um, before we wrap up for today, but it's a question about your exciting new venture, Carol Meats. Um, the question is around what your business strategy might be. Um, are you planning to have this organization give technical assistance for cultivated meat companies, or are you planning to go into the marketplace with your own distribution and, and selling um, your own products? Well, so, so my um, uh, collaborator, Ali Reza, is, uh, is leading the company. So I'm, I'm taking the backseat from the company's perspective. I'm more of the academic uh, angle, angle to this. Uh, but uh, we are in the process, so we are co-founders of the, of the company, and we are in the process of uh, actually going through an incubator to actually define our strategy, right? But what we think we will be, at least in, the, in this stage, is that we will focus on the assembly and the bioreactor bit. We will partner with companies which are actually making uh, the, the primary cells and, and supplying it to us, as well as the serum-free uh, media. Uh, and, and from a distribution and marketing perspective, what we think will happen, I think this is true for any startup company in this, in this business, is that you'd have to partner with one of the bigger meat distribution companies. And uh, so, so in Canada, we have Maple Leaf Foods, Tyson is another example. So these distributors are the people who have the know-how and the technology to actually move these products beyond. So we would be potentially suppliers to them. Uh, so that's that's the plan for now. Now that could change in, in a couple of months as we go through this incubator process. So. Yeah, we're really excited to see, kind of watch this process unfold and follow your journey. Um, I'm aware that there are only two minutes left. I think actually the clock turns, so we have one minute. Um, so I wanna thank you again, Ravi, so much for joining us today. I learned a ton. This was a fantastic presentation um, and I'm excited to watch it back over again once the recording is up on our YouTube channel. Um, before we wrap up for today, are there any last thoughts you'd like to leave our scientific community with? No, I think the, the, the field is in a, in a very exciting phase. I think, uh uh it, it's almost uh, close to this tipping point where there is enough uh, interest and the technology is approaching uh, as compared to it was five years ago right and so so i think um, this is this is a moment in time where people coming into the field can make a meaningful difference in and and, and contribute and and if we reach that cost parity for instance then it is it's, it's bound to bound to explode but I think the fundamental aspect of this is that very similar to renewable energy, uh, where 
about 10 years ago, you saw that, well, the solar was the thing to be there. There were some stumbling blocks and so on, but, but it could be quickly overcome. I think this field is also there where uh, this increase in meat consumption and demand has to have a solution, right? And, and constantly uh, clearing forests and growing more crops is not necessarily the answer. So I think that there's an inevitability to, to this and which is very promising for the field, so. Agreed. Thank you so much, Ravi. We're all excited about um, the potential of your research to help us build a more sustainable food system. Um, it was such an honor to have you here today. And um, to everyone there in the audience, um, I would recommend that you all check out our competitive research grant program. Over the course of his talk, Ravi cited so many additional questions that are underexplored in this area, uh, future directions um, that, that uh, researchers in the audience might like to take as we work together to advance the cultivated meat field. And Ravi, you're entirely correct. Um, especially in these early stages, it's so critical that we kind of work across the disciplinary divide and, and collaborate to make these technologies possible as we demonstrate the, the, the potential for price parity um, and scale. So thank you so, so much for joining us today, Ravi. Um, it was such a pleasure to have you here. Um, everyone, I will see you again next month. Um, we will be joined by Professor Dave Block from UC Davis um, to give us a discussion or an overview of research advancements in cell culture media. Um, so again, thank you so much, Dr. Ravi Selvaganapathy. Um, I hope to see you all again next month. Thanks for the invitation. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye.